it's about one of the most defining periods of my life. And one in which I learned that sometimes you get lucky, like sometimes you win a raffle or the lottery, but mostly you make your own luck. You do the things you need to do to put yourself in the position to win. And we succeed because we set goals for ourselves, and we accomplish them through confidence, courage, and determination. You have right here, which is just good enough, and you can coast along and go through your reviews, and the FBI, yes, their supervisors reviewed us, et cetera, and collect your paycheck, and never really break a case, and never really catch a terrorist, and never really take down a spy, but you can do what you need to do, or you can work that bit higher, what we called the kick-ass line. And those were the operatives, the undercover guys, who were catching the guys, who were breaking the cases, who were doing that kind of stuff. And it's that kind of idea that you have to do your best. Anything worse than your best meant failure. My job was to be a ghost. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, what I did, uh, I was a fully 24-7 undercover operative. My job was to do counterterrorism and counterintelligence. That meant terrorists and spies. Um, those could be spies who were uh, foreign nationals who were here in the U.S. operating against us. Or it could be some of our own people who had turned, like Robert Hansen and Aldrich Ames and Earl Pitts and Nicholson, all people that I worked during my career in the FBI. My job was mostly to be unseen. We called ourselves ghosts. And so I was behind the camera. I was using disguises. You know, one day I might be dressed uh, in a business suit because I had to follow someone into a corporate place. Or another day, uh, I might be dressed as a delivery guy because back before 9-11, you can get into any business uh, in, in the area uh, just dressed as a uh, FedEx guy or a delivery guy with a little clipboard. Um, and sometimes a homeless person because no one notices homeless people. I used disguises. I had the spirit gum beard that I put on, I could stick on real quick. And I had glasses that I had specially magnified so I could see license plates a little bit farther. Uh, I followed people in cars, I followed people on foot, I listened to people sleep, and most often snore, unfortunately. Imagine sitting eight hours in a van, you know, it's not all sexy stuff, listening to somebody in their house and hearing them snore for eight hours and not being allowed to turn it down because, well, you turn it down and that's the second that you miss out on what happened. Here's the thing about spies, a little bit of insight into spies. Spies are suspicious. Spies are not paranoid. If you've ever been paranoid, then you know when you're paranoid, you can't function. And if you're a spy and you're paranoid, you're always unable to do anything because you always think that that grandma in the mall behind you is really surveillance. And you always think that that car that took two turns with you is out to get you. And you can't stop looking up because that's where they look down to spot you, right? You, go, you, you freeze, you can't move. So what spies need to do is be suspicious. And it's that suspicion that keeps you safe. Here's the difference between me and some, maybe probably many of you, probably some of you. How many people came to the hotel and immediately went through your room, including opening the balcony and looking at all the sight lines from the top buildings? I did. It's not because I'm weird, it's because the training was beat into me, you know? How many people walked around the hotel because you want to figure out a pattern for different uh, entrances and exits and understand the layout and understand where everything is. I was flipping through uh, the program and I saw the scavenger hunt, right? This was after I did a quick walkthrough. I saw the scavenger hunt and I was like, oh, this is cool. Oh, hey, if I had my cell phone, I'd already won. <laughs> I'd know where all that stuff is. I'm not gonna help you. <laughs> Unless it's something really hard. But the training is to always be aware of your surroundings, to see everything around you, to take in all this information and somewhere in your weird brain, filter it into something that helps you, that gives you what's called actionable, and actionable intelligence. And that's what Robert Hansen had to do. You know, just as I was working him on one side, he, he had to find out whether he was safe. Because this guy had been dumped in the State Department for years. He'd just been put out to pasture because he was somewhat of an embarrassment. He choked a subordinate. Uh, and a woman. And, uh, and, and so they just wanted him to bite out his time. But suddenly they're bringing him back, giving him a position that had never existed, that he wanted for his entire career, uh, promoting him to executive service, and finally, for the first time, giving him staff, which was me. It, it sounds too good to be true. It played to his ego. He wanted it, but it's too good to be true. So this guy took the job, but he had to figure out if he was safe. He had to be a good spy, not go paranoid. He had to keep active 
but he had to figure out if he was safe, and there were only two guys in the room, and I was the other one. So he had to work on me, and he did. And we engaged in this game of dialogue. I had reserved this big black Suburban. And so he uh, and I walked down in the parking lot, and we've got this thing in, in uh, the spy business called Murphy's Law. Whatever will go wrong, whatever can go wrong will go wrong, so plan for every eventuality. I hadn't planned for every eventuality. The problem was, the damn car wasn't there. So we get down there, and now I'm, I'm walking around with Super Spy behind me. You know, this big six foot four tall guy kind of glumphing along behind me, looking for this car, feeling more and more anxious. And it's not there. And we go two levels, it's not there. Now he's getting pissed off. Well, good, okay. Now I guess I'm getting him angry. I've screwed up the whole operation for the day. I got to save this somehow. I guess I'll just piss him off. Maybe not the smartest thing to do, but there you go. So uh, uh, he comes to me and he says, Eric, you have failed and we're going to take my car. Uh, and I looked at him and I thought, well, here goes, nothing. Nah, we're not taking your car. We're going to walk around until we find that Suburban. It was like a light switch flipped. This guy went nuts. You never saw something like it. He went from kind of a, a aloof, cold, um, uninterested, un connected person to this raging monster with a red face and an angry face and shaking and he grabbed me by the shirt and he lifted me up on my toes. And uh, at that point, the first thing that went through my mind after a lifetime of martial arts was to break an arm and put him on the ground and then stand on his head. <laughs> but you can't do that because it ruins the whole operation. You got to kind of not do that, right? And, uh, uh, and what I had to do was talk him off the ledge. Because I also had to keep him comfortable, right? So I say, look, 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 whoa, 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 hold on, relax, boss, relax. Here's the whole story behind this. I, I, we got to take the big black FBI Suburban. Yes, the FBI has lots of big black FBI Suburbans, if you were wondering. Uh, the stuff in the movies is true. Uh, I said, we got to take the Suburban because, well, you're, you're an executive in the FBI. You're, you're one of the top supervisors. You can't roll up to the NSA in a Ford Taurus. We got to show up in the big black car with me driving. We got to show up hard. And he looks at me and he kind of he kind of smiles and he goes, "Yeah, okay, but we're taking my car." Blew the op, made him angry, got at least that box checked, right? But he felt more comfortable with me because what kind of a crazy undercover operative would purposely piss off the person that's his target? Well, nobody. But it worked for me. The most fabricated scene in the movie was where Hanson shoots at me with a gun. Uh, that never happened. That was added later. And it was added because uh, some producer uh, sat down at a table of producers and said, you can't have an FBI movie where nobody shoots at the hero. <laughs> and the director, who was also the writer, said, uh, it never happened in real life. Eric's going to have to stand up there for the rest of his life and explain that this didn't happen. Uh, they didn't care. Uh, and they, they were writing the checks. So we wrote a scene that could have happened, 